Well, good morning. Oh, sorry, good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to be talking about prayer and this parable the Lord told about two men who go up to the temple to pray. But we're going to start by praying and uh, bring before the Lord the various things we've just raised. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, Father, we are praying to you here in this pub right now we are before you and we ask you heavenly father to be with and bless each of us above all things so that we will come to everlasting life so that we will not turn away but we might run with patience the race set before us and we pray for jesus to soon come to ultimately bring about that global peace that that we we so wish would be on the earth we pray father that we might live that kingdom life now and that we might be the peacemakers who are blessed and will inherit the earth in the end. We pray, Father, for Alicia. We pray for Mason. We pray, Father, that you will work in the lives of every one of us and that we might perceive that and we might realise that you are so active in our lives. And we ask, Father, that you will help those here who have not yet committed themselves totally to you to do so and that you'll give each of us meetings of people whom we can help to you, whom we can witness to, whom we can assist, whom we can serve in some way with your blessing to your glory and the glory of our dear Lord Jesus. So please open our eyes now as we, as we hear again the teaching of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Saviour. We pray that we might see what it is to pray and that you will be with us. For his sake. Amen. Right, well, week 18 is all about prayer, and of course, prayer is a big factor in the Christian life. And there's two parables here about prayer that are a little bit related. And I said before we looked at the parables that there's always something a bit unusual in all of them. They appear to be homely little stories, but actually there is a, a twist in them. There's something in them that is unreal, that is not normal. So, we're going to start with the first one. <clears throat> he spoke a parable to them that they should always pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a city a judge who didn't fear God and had no regard for man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came often to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he would not, but afterward he said to himself, oh, I neither fear God nor regard man. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will give her justice, lest she wear me out by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And shall not God give justice to his chosen who cry to him day and night? Will he be slow to help them? I say to you that he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Now I said that all the parables have got a bit in them that are that, that's sort of unusual. And the immediately unusual thing here is that it's a woman who is going to the judge demanding justice because in those days a woman couldn't go to court. It, courts and legal stuff was all between men. A woman couldn't go to court. She would not be listened to. She was a widow, which meant that she had no man in her life. Typically, if you were a woman who had an issue, you got some male in your family to go and, and have it out at court. But she doesn't have a man in her life. She's a widow. And she keeps on going to this unjust judge, which implies that he dealt with issues like, give me some money and I'll give you the, uh, give you the answer you want. Well, although this man doesn't fear God nor regards man, he just gets fed up with the woman because she keeps on and on and eventually he says, okay, I'll give it, give it to you. And the contrast, of course, is with God, who, if that's what an unrighteous man judge does, we are praying to the judge of all the earth. How much more do you think he is going to listen to us? And Paul makes this point in Romans when he says that, sure, God or Jesus, they are the judge, but they are also 
the advocate, like if you go to court, you have like a, uh, a counsel, you have an advocate, you have somebody who puts your case, a lawyer who puts your case to the judge. But the judge is the same as your lawyer. They're all on your side. God wants to hear you. But the point is, you've got to keep on asking. And you think, well, why would that be? Well, how would it be otherwise if God said, okay, the minute you open your mouth and ask for something, I'll give it to you. Name it and claim it, you get it. Oh, you want a new car? Oh, you want a, you know, you want a thousand pounds? Oh, okay, I'll just uh, parachute it down for you. What's your next request? No. God is not an ATM. God is not an ATM. You don't have the magic code that you type in and whoosh, everything is resolved. Not at all. There is a struggle in prayer. There has to be. Because God wants our relationship with Him. He wants us to be in relationship with Him. It is, of course, like your children. You do not give children immediately what they want. I want this. Oh, so you must have it. We all know what happens to kids if that's how you raise them. And it's not that God doesn't love us. It is that God is God and we are men. And that's how it is. But you notice that it's a widow, as I say. And, well, a woman doesn't go to court. She always has to get a man to do it in their culture. And this is part of what you could call the great reversal, the great turning of upside, things upside down in Luke's Gospel particularly, that it is always the humble, the sinners, the poor, the women, the excluded, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. It's always them who come out on top, and it is the Pharisees and the, the corrupt and the powerful guys who are shown to be as nothing in God's eyes. So there's a great reversal, and you wonder why it is that Christianity, not exclusively, but generally appeals to the poor. As the Lord himself said, to the poor the gospel is preached. And Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, you see, you're calling. How not many mighty, not many smart, not many wise in this world are called. It doesn't say nobody is. It just says not many. Because this is a whole thing that it is good news for the poor. Not just materially poor, but poor in whatever way. You can be a tax collector like Zacchaeus, who's wealthy, but he's excluded from society for whatever reason. Or the widow, she's got no man in her life. She can't get justice. But she ends up on top. She ends up the winner and not the loser. So, you then come to this other parable he, about prayer. He spoke this parable also to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with despite. <coughs> Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, the tax collectors were Jews who worked for the Romans, grabbing all this tax money off poor people and were despised as traitors, as people who were driving their own people into poverty and lining their own pockets, so no one liked tax collectors. So a Pharisee and a tax collector go up into the temple to pray. Well, I would just point out that they apparently go at the same time. Come back to that in a moment. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. This bloke over here. Um, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but struck his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I say to you, this man went down to his home justified, which means counted righteous, rather than the other, for everyone that exalts himself will be humble, but he that humbles himself will be exalted. So, two men go to pray at the same time. And one of them beats on his breast and says, I am such a sinner. And the other guy says, I fast and I give tithes. They go at the same time. So I suggest that this uh, to Jewish ears hearing this the first time. This would have sounded like this was a Jewish feast, that this was some sort of corporate worship. I suggest the Day of Atonement. Now, once a year, the Jews have, well, under the law of Moses, they had Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
The idea was that the sacrifices that had been offered for your sins weren't uh, completely adequate. And once a year, they came to the temple and confessed their sins, beat upon their chest, confessed their sins, and a sacrifice was offered for them. And Paul in Hebrews says that, yeah, there you are, you see, the law of Moses couldn't save you. So, even within the law of Moses, there was this hint at Jesus, because the Lord Jesus was represented by the animal that was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. So, to Jewish years, this would have been, oh yeah, the Day of Atonement. Okay. One guy goes up there, beats on his chest and confesses his sins, gets forgiven. But the other guy prays, verse 11, with himself. Oh God, I thank you, I'm not as other men. He prays with himself. Now what an insight that is into, if you like, depth psychology. That you can pray to God, so you think, when it is one half of your brain talking to another half of your brain that you call God. Now we can all slip into that. When you pray to God, as the Lord said, you start by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, and I'll be your name. You just start with that, right, I am here, and he is there. And my little words are coming into his presence. I am in his presence. That's how we should feel when we pray. But if you don't think it all out, you think, oh, I should pray. It's you talking to yourself. So although he says God, like he comes to God in prayer, Jesus says he, he stands there praying with himself. And prayer needs to be thought out. I know there's times when you just have to pray just like that. <laughs> oh, God help me. You know, like, well, of course. But the fact that that's okay to pray like that does not mean that that's the only kind of prayer you should make. You think about it, before you start, like, I am here, right. God is there, I am going to say this, <laughs> Jesus is my advocate before him. And he's not confessing his sins, he says, I thank you that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. So he considers everybody else to be an extortioner, unrighteous, or unjust, or an adulterer. Well, I thank you, God, I'm not like that. When you read through the Gospels about what they say about the Pharisees, Jesus says, you are extortioners. You take money off people wrongly. You are unjust. You are not just. And you're adulterers. For example, in John 8, you have the woman who was taken in adultery, having committed adultery with a, a bunch of Pharisees all through the night. So it was the Pharisees who were extortioners, unjust and adulterers. And this Pharisee stands there and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like that. I'm not like this tax collector. He's like that. Now, psychologists would say that's a classic case of transference. That you've got all this guilt in you about, what, extortion, being unjust and being an adulterer, and you stick it on the other guy. Oh, you terrible person. Now, sometimes you come across stories, or not stories, but reality, where you might get a pastor who's been very, oh, very tough about adultery and very tough about this, that, the other. You commit adultery, you're out of the church. If you do this, you're out of the church. Uh, whoops, it turns out that he's like the biggest adulterer of the lot. And you think, oh wow, what a hypocrite. How could he do that? Well, psychologists would say, oh, no problem there, yeah, that's transference, yep. Yeah. He's got all this guilt, and he sticks it on someone else. And beats up on that person. You know, classic. So what do you do with guilt? Do you stick it on someone else? Let's say you are an extortioner, you're unjust and an adulterer. What do you do? Stick it on someone else and beat them up? No. Where do you put it? On Jesus. On the head of Jesus. Who was the scapegoat that they also offered on the Day of Atonement. That they confessed their sins over the scapegoat. They had two goats. One they killed, 
The other, they confessed their sins over this animal and it ran away free. To show that, yeah, because Jesus died, that was the goat that died, and is alive, that's the goat that wasn't killed, all your sins have been taken far, far away. He is the guilt offering. That's what to do with your guilt. Now, I said before, there's false guilt and there's true guilt. There's false guilt that people put on you, make you feel bad about yourself. You shouldn't this or you shouldn't that. I gave, gave the example of smoking cigarettes and people who haven't got a marriage certificate and people are made to feel awful about themselves and I suggest that's false guilt. But then there's true guilt, right? actual sins. That is dealt with in Jesus. You don't have to put it on someone else and then do what this Pharisee did or what some pastor does and is an adulterer, let's say, but he sticks it all on some, some guy and, uh oh let's kick him out of the church, you're an awful man. Yeah? This is typical. So, <clears throat> this parable is spoken to those who trusted, verse 9, and the word trust means to believe. I know that in English the words trust and faith or trust and belief are very different, they sound different. But in Hebrew and Greek and in fact in, in Russian, for example, the, the two <coughs> words are the same, there is no difference. To believe is to trust. These people believed or trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Well, Luke was a friend of Paul. I know both Luke and Paul were inspired by God, but you come to Romans, Paul's all about this all the time, that you are justified, you are counted righteous by faith, by trust. Not in yourselves, but in the righteousness of Jesus the Lord, our righteousness. What that means is that we who are sinners, because we're in Christ, and because we trust and believe in Him, are counted as if we are righteous, as good as Him. That's difficult to get your head around, but I am a sinner. And there's so many people say, oh, I can't be baptised, oh, I can't come to church, I'm a sinner. Oh, you don't know how bad I am. But this is the point. That we who are sinners are counted as righteous, and you think, well, how can that be legitimately done? If I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. How can God look at me as if I'm righteous? Or not? Well, this is why it's so important to be in Christ. That if we're in Him, we are counted as if we are Him. And God will look at us as if we're him. To give you a crude example, you're chatting with a woman who says, oh, I'm going to marry this guy. And we say, say yeah, but you know, he's an, you know he's an alcoholic, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know he's an alcoholic. He's a lovely bloke, a lovely man. And you say, like, um, you realise there's going to be uh, difficulties with money and with sorts of things and he's drunk every other day oh yeah 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 but he's lovely has he hit you yet oh yeah he, he slapped me pretty hard a couple of times but he, he was drunk he was drunk at the time and you think you're not even married yet he, he slapped you a couple of times oh that's because he was drunk he's a lovely bloke she's not love is not blind right that woman sees what he's like She's not blind, she sees what he's like, but she sees him as being wonderful, because that's what love does. That's what love does. The object of your love you see as wonderful. You have your first child. Oh, there's this baby photo. I've got to send it all to everybody. Look how beautiful my baby is. The newborn babies aren't actually beautiful at all. They're only beautiful in the eyes of the uh, of the parent. They're not very pretty, newborn babies. Oh, they get prettier when they're like, they get cute when they're like two years old or something. Face is fleshed out a bit. But when they're newborns, newborn babies, oh, particularly attractive. Oh, but it's, I look at a beautiful baby. This is what it is to count someone righteous or count someone wonderful because you love them. That's what love does. You count them as wonderful. I'm sure you all met people who are totally in love, so, oh, you know, my Johnny or my whoever, my whatever, she's wonderful. She, oh, she's awesome. You think, oh, 
you know, so you think, well, I guess you think so. And we, we see all the you know, weaknesses, but the lover sees the beloved as wonderful. That's how it is. That's what love is. Right? And like they say, ah, she's my princess, and he thinks she's a princess, and for him, she is his princess. Wonderful. But she wouldn't be anyone else's princess, but that's all right. That's fine. He sees her that way. That's wonderful. Um, you know, a woman may think, oh, my Johnny or Webby's my knight in shining armour. You think, oh, really? Okay. To you, he is. That's good. Now, this is what love does, and this is what God does with us, because we are in Christ. You see, what it means to be in Christ, it means to be part of Jesus, to be in his body, to be counted as if you are him. That's why... You know, I would crawl across England on my hands and knees if necessary to baptise just one person. Really and truly, I, I would. Because then you become in him and you are counted as him and you have this special status, if you like, in, in God's eyes. So, this Pharisee, he trusted, he had faith in himself that he was righteous. We know you're not righteous, and that's how the whole story ends up. And that's why, verse 14, it's the tax collector who goes down to his home justified, counted righteous, rather than the other. Because he believed. So the tax collector, verse 13, standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but struck his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, be sinner. So he stands far away in a sense, although not that far away because the Pharisee can see him. There's the two blokes in the temple and the Pharisee says, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, even like <clears throat> this tax collector. So the tax collector's standing quite near him. <coughs> but the tax collector in his own mind stands far away. He thinks, Oh, who am I? I'm not worthy. Who am I? He wouldn't lift up his eyes to heaven. And here's a question to each of Can you lift up your eyes to heaven and pray? Jesus did. Many times the Lord has spoken of as lifting up his eyes to heaven and pray. Because there was no barrier of sin and bad conscience between Jesus and, and his Father. Can you do that? We are to examine ourselves when we break bread. And there's a question for you. Can you do that? My answer is sometimes yes, sometimes not. Just my answer. Um, but you all have to answer that question. But he could not do that. He felt that barrier. And he struck his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. So he was convicted very much, and he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. When he says that, he's quoting from King David in the Old Testament, in Psalm 32. What did King David do? Well, he's a good guy in his own way, but um, he committed adultery, literally with a girl next door, literally, a woman called Bathsheba, who was not only the girl next door, but was the wife of one of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah. And so while Uriah is away fighting, for David at the battlefront, he gets Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, sleeps with her, then gets Uriah to come back from the front and sets up a horrible thing whereby Uriah gets murdered. So he's guilty of adultery and murder. This is a bloke who's got stacks of wives anyway. And basically under the law of Moses for that, he had to die. There was no sacrifice, as he says. There is no sacrifice I can offer. There's no prescribed sacrifice. So, oh, if you <coughs> commit murder, if you commit adultery, just offer a sacrifice and you're good. No. And so he comes to God and says, God, be merciful to me. By grace. I know I should die, but please be merciful to me. And God is. God is. God was merciful to David. He didn't have to die. And this man quotes that about himself. So David's sin becomes every man and woman's sin. The wage of sin is death, so why are we alive? Why is our heart still beating? Why are we still standing here? By grace. 
we're, every second we're only alive by grace. Because we should be dead. But we're not. So you see, that's why you can never presume upon life. I've got a right to life. Well, I understand that in a secular sense. But as sinners, as believers, we don't have a right to life. I deserve death. But God has been merciful to me. And I'm alive. And this is the great meaning of life. Now people get depressed and all the rest of it because they see no reason to life. I understand that in secular life. But for those of us in Christ, we are alive. We have been forgiven. We have been given life. Well, so he says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. It's as if he feels that I am the worst sinner. When you put Paul's letters in chronological order, right, which they're not actually in the English Bible, but when you put them in chronological order and you read them chronologically right, over time, you'll see that his awareness of his own sin gets deeper and deeper. But at the same time, his certainty of salvation becomes stronger and stronger. So, for example, he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, I am the, the least of the apostles. I'm an apostle, but I'm the least of the apostles. And then he, he says that he is, later on in another letter, that I'm the least of all the believers. To the Ephesians, I'm less than the least of all saints. Starts off, I'm the least of the apostles. A few years later, I'm the least of all the believers. And then when he's about to die, he's writing to Timothy, to Timothy, just as he's in the cell, saying, I'm going to be sacrificed, I'm going to be offered, I'm going to be killed any time now. He says, I am chief of sinners. I am the world's worst sinner. But at the same time, when he's writing to Timothy, he's absolutely confident, I'm going to be saved, no question. I'm going to come to the judgment and be justified. I'm right. I'm good. I've got eternity in front of me. I'm at peace. Now you see the two strands. On one hand, real, being more and more convicted of your sinfulness, but on the other hand, more and more convicted that I am going to live forever. I am going to be saved. This life was just a few millimetres compared to the eternal long line of God's kingdom of eternity in front of me. And this man starts to get there when he beats upon his breast and says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm the worst of the lot. Now, it is seen as sort of old school and old hat. Oh, don't keep on about sin. Idea in society, the idea in the Christian groups is that you walk in, how are you? I'm awesome. How are you? Awesome. Ah, oh, everything's awesome. Well, everything is awesome. In Jesus. Apart from the fact, well, it is awesome. But the fact is, we are sinners. Paul says, we have been saved from God's wrath through Jesus Christ. But if you have no place in your mind for the anger of God, the sin, the judgment of God, well, what is the good news? I'm saved from wrath through Jesus. Well, if I don't, if I think I'm an awesome top bloke, don't do anything wrong. It's all them. It was all her. It's all. You, her, uh, then society, I, I myself on the top row. What is the good news of Jesus Christ for you then? That's the thing. And you will have no real flame of praise. You will have no real devotion. I want to devote everything in my life to him because of what he's done for me. Unless you're going to make that acceptance. God have mercy on me, the sinner. Now, he beats upon his breast and says, God have mercy on me, the sinner. There's only one other place in the Gospels, and it's also in Luke, where you read of men beating upon their breast. And it is when the Lord Jesus dies on the cross. It's when he gives up his last breath. We're told the centurion was standing there, the Roman soldier, the Roman officer that was like superintending the whole horrible business, and that this guy, the centurion, Luke says, beat upon his breast and said, surely, truly, this was the Son of God. So it was standing at the cross that elicited the beating upon the breast. We think, well, I get you, Duncan, but I'm afraid 
I don't get that total feeling that I am the sinner. Well, this is why we're told to examine ourselves as we break bread. Because as you stand in your own mind, in front of him crucified, naturally it elicits from you your own sinfulness. It comes out. You cannot stand there thinking, oh, how awesome am I? I've done nothing. If you imagine the process and feel yourself as there, well, it does elicit self-examination. But, out of the same thing, it, to it totally persuades you that because he did that for me, I am saved. Now, you see, work together, as it were, in the texture of, of our total human personality. There is, therefore, this strong these two strands. I am a sinner, I am unworthy, but I am confident of who I am in Jesus Christ, that I will be saved. And that, that, that's very, that's a very attractive uh, sort of mix of the two strands. That I'm confident I'll be saved, although I am a sinner. And that's what I think makes your witness powerful in this world. People don't want some overconfident, smiley, you know, uh, person coming up to them saying, you know, oh yes, would you like to come to our church, you're all saved, and uh, yes, it's all awesome, and all this. I don't know, for me that's a big term. Big term. I prefer some guy to come up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not perfect, and I've totally messed up, and I feel like the bottom, but I'm, I'm at the top. I'm going to be saved. Oh wow. Yeah, they're now talking. Because the more real, the more credible. The more real, the more credible. So, this man goes down to his house, the tax collector, justified, counted righteous. You see at the start of it, two men, verse 10, went up to the temple. The temple was on, a, on the Mount Zion, right? So they walked up the hill, did their thing, and walked down, but only one of them, as a tax collector, went down to his house, justified, counted righteous. The other guy wasn't counted righteous because he trusted in himself that he was righteous. And this is the great reversal, that the guy who is so pious, that is so, you know, I, I don't sin, I, yeah, I thank God I'm not like other men. It's him who is, comes out of the story not saved. But it's the guy who says, me? Oh, God have mercy on me. I am the worst. I really feel the worst. Why would you have pity on a dog like me? It's him who comes down from the Mount Zion to his home, justified, counted righteous by God. And this is how it is. You might have seen those little cartoons that sort of float around social media when it's, there's a church with everyone in the pew with their suits and ties. They all look in a skull and see this bloke who's like a biker or something, you know, thinking, what's he doing here? You know, he's the one who God's, he's got a heart for God. Now, I'm not against, you know, people who, you know, do the religious thing. There's a lot of very sincere people amongst them as well. Don't, don't throw them up. But I'm just saying, and then the Lord concludes, everyone that exalts himself, like the, tax, the uh, Pharisee, Oh, I thank, uh, praying to himself, I thank God that I'm not like other men. They will be humbled, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. I want to talk finally a little bit about humility, because humility was understood differently in the ancient world. Don't forget, we are reading this in London, UK, 21st century. About all this was said and done in the context of Palestine in the first century. Hum to be humbled was always something that was done to you, against your will. If you were captured in a war, then you were humiliated. You were brought down. And that's what they used to do to people. That, oh, I beat you in the, uh, in the race, or whatever it was. Oh, you're a loser. I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to humiliate you. Whereas today, we are used to wars, even, and um, 
sporting events where the loser is not humiliated in that sense. Um, and, you know, we, we try to learn our lesson as society and we try to play on, don't we? You don't humiliate the loser. But in their culture, that was part of what was done to losers. You were humiliated. You were made to wear humiliating clothes. You were made to do humiliating things. But Jesus says here, you've got to humble yourself. Now that was unheard of to them. I'm only going to be humble if somebody else crushes me down because I'm a loser. But he says, no, no, you humble yourself. And then you will be exalted. And this is really what it's all about. I mean, how did this tax collector humble himself? He was a wealthy man, actually. He was actually more wealthy, probably, than the Pharisee, because tax collectors are wealthy. He humbled himself by recognizing, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The humbling was all inside his own mind. And of course this reminds us of Philippians chapter 2 about the Lord Jesus on the cross. That he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross, and therefore he was highly exalted and given the name about every name. You read Philippians 2, you see that there's seven statements about his progressive humiliation. The last two, six and seven, he, he humbled himself to die, even the death of the cross, the most humiliating death naked, abused, covered in blood and spittle. And then you've got seven stages of his exaltation. He's given the name above every name. It's like the Avisha. And that is what's going on with all of us. That we are being humbled so that we might be exalted. Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So God is trying to push you down. That you might be exalted in due time, which I suggest is when the Lord Jesus returns. So, in a sense, it's a race to the bottom that we are to understand that I will be humbled. And I think that's why built into the structure of being human, you do lose your strength, you do lose your faculties, you do lose your good looks, you do lose your marbles as you get older. That's why it is. It's all part of the bigger picture. Why does life go wrong for us as believers? Well, I think it is part of this process that we are being humbled progressively so that we might be exalted. You can't have it both ways. You can't be wonderful and exalted now and also for eternity. You've got to be brought down and up. It's that V shape. So that's a takeaway, I think, for us today, that the V, the v process. That, in a sense, just be prepared for it that you cannot be brought down. You, know, you might be, for example, a very good a painter, but then you done it for years, but then you, you make an uncharacteristically stupid mistake, and you mess up someone's wall. You may be a very good driver, and you never break the speed limit, and you never slip into a bus lane, and there's a camera up, but you do. You always keep the speed limit, but the one time you don't, ah, you get done for it. Why does this happen? It's all part of, and I notice in believers' lives, this sort of thing happens a lot. Because it's all under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that you might be exalted. It's not that God is being mean. It's not that he's bringing you down. In a nasty sense. He's helping you to get with the process, to see that life is not going to work out so awesome. It does work out awesomely, but not necessarily in a material sense. And this, as Luke in his Gospel is keeps bringing out, is the great reversal. That the arrogant, the self-righteous, do not go down to their house justified. They're not right with God. But a guy who thinks, well, I'm a no-hoper, I'm a loser. I'm a tax collector, I'm a thief, I've betrayed my people. I, I'm, I'm out of society quite rightly. Yeah. He goes down to his house with God loving him and counting him as wonderful and righteous. So this is the whole thing, that we are counted righteous 
because of our faith in the work of Jesus. We believe he existed, we believe that he was perfect, he was our representative, never sinned, died, rose again, and if I am in him, this will be my pattern. And God sees me as him. And that is what faith is. Faith is not just acceptance that Jesus existed, just acceptance that he died on the cross. Faith is trust. Faith is trust. To believe is to trust. I trust that God does see me like this. He thinks the world of me. I don't know why, but he does. And I think it's difficult to believe in that kind of love because in all our secular relationships we never encountered that kind of love. You encountered someone who loved you because of this or that or the other. But this is a love without all that, you know? He loves her because he likes her earrings, he likes the way she talks, <coughs> he likes the way she's so intelligent. <coughs> now that is, you know, people fall out of love as they get older and, oh, she doesn't got the earrings anymore, she doesn't got the looks anymore, and she's not so smart anymore. He realises she's not as smart as he thought she was. <coughs> but, you see, the whole thing is, that God looks at us differently. Absolutely. He loves us not because of who we are. He loves us simply so. And this is grace. This is grace. Absolutely. This is love. This is the love that counts righteous. And faith, trust, what is faith? Trust that this is true. That he does see me like this, so that you can walk in this world with your head up. Not in arrogance, no. Not in arrogance. But that I've got somebody. And they love me. And I am not, you know, as people think I am, I am loved. And even if I stand on my back to the world, and everybody thinks I'm a bad guy, or everyone doesn't like me, or whatever, or I'm a nobody, I've got no money, I've got no job, I've got no career, I've got no family anymore, I've got no nothing, whatever. He thinks the world of me. Now you see in human relationships, you have someone who's had an awful experience of life, and oh, but they meet someone who loves them. Oh, well oh, I've got someone. And they put it on their Facebook profile, they go on social media, I've got someone who thinks the world of me. And I don't care what the rest of you think. Well, that's right, that's love, isn't it? But we have got someone. Is this is why I say to you, Jesus is real. It's not an idea. He is real, he is there. And this is all marvellously true. So we can go out of the pub now, go down to our homes, justify, count it righteous, because he loves us. Let's give thanks for the uh, bread. I mean, he, this is possible because he died and rose again, because of what's represented by the bread and the cup. Let's give thanks for the bread. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread in which we see the symbol of his love for us, the communion of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him with all our hearts and we pray that we might feel his love, that this might be real and true in our lives and our self-understanding in every aspect and dimension of our lives and being in this world. For his sake. Amen. Amen.
So let's uh, let's give thanks for the uh, cup. Uh, Kevin, would you like your thanks to the cup? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the juice that we're going to partake in, shedding of the blood of Jesus. Bless it by now, we thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So this is the symbol of his life, his blood shed for us. So let's close down with a prayer for the food, which I see is appealing. Um, anyone want to give thanks to the food? Who wants to give a prayer for the food? Oh, Corinne, would you like to give thanks to the food? Yes, I want to say thank you for all that you have provided for us, for my sisters, my brothers, for this big loving family, and all that you provide for us in every way. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Corinne. I'll see you all later. I'll see you, Karen. God bless you.